This week we're going to start a new series on aquarium maintenance, starting with water changes, how much, how often, and of course what salt to use. Hi, I'm Ryan, host of BRS TV, where each week we cover a new topic related to reefing. This week we're going to dive into water changes. The best water change schedule can really be debated to the end of time, but before we jump into that, I think we need to hit on why we're doing them in the first place. The most obvious thing we're doing is removing some of the nutrients and contaminants that feed algae growth and irritate fish or corals. More or less, what we're doing is diluting the concentration of these elements by removing some water and replacing it with fresh salt water, which presumably has less of these elements. These contaminants come from a wide variety of sources, including coral and fish foods, top-off water, common additives, and even the toxins that corals emit to maintain their territory. It's pretty well known that foods can be a source of algae-feeding nutrients like phosphate and nitrate, but it's also common for many foods that contain small amounts of metals that can build up over time as well. Some of these things can be removed via protein skimmer or refugium, well-maintained filter socks, and other methods, but what's left over will have to be removed in another way. If you're using dechlorinated but unfiltered city or well water, there's really no way of knowing what's in it, but there absolutely are some nutrients and metals picked up from your city's old plumbing, surface water, or groundwater. Most retail aquarium additives are fairly pure, but some can contain relatively small amounts of contaminants that can build up over time. However, there are some things you might not consider a contaminant. For instance, when you add calcium or magnesium chloride, you're adding calcium and magnesium, but you're also adding chloride as well. Since chloride is the most abundant ion in seawater, it isn't considered to be a big issue for most people, but if you never did a water change, it would absolutely build up over time and raise the salinity of your tank. Lastly, many corals emit toxins to preserve their tiny piece of the reef. In the ocean, these toxins dissipate very quickly and really only effective right next to the coral. However, in the aquarium, these toxins have nowhere to go, so they'll just build up over time. It may even cause other corals to attempt to fight back with more of their own toxin. Carbon in ozone is a good option for this, but if you don't use either of these, water changes might be the best solution. On the flip side of that, there are also things we want to add back to the water. In some cases, this might be major elements like calcium, alkalinity, or magnesium, but more often it's trace elements. Corals consume elements like strontium, potassium, lithium, palladium, zinc, barium, really all kinds of things. Since most of these things don't have test kits available, or if they do, they're hard to do and the results are suspect, it's very common for reefers to replace trace elements with water changes. Well, this is easier and I think the safest of all the options. Unless you're doing large, regular water changes, this is only a partial solution. However, there's little to no risk of overdosing and the least complex method until you find a brand of additives you trust or implement another partial solution like a calcium reactor. Okay, so we get that water changes are important. So how often and how big? Well, I'd say somewhere in between almost never and 100% every week. Really, it depends on the tank. For instance, a 40-gallon tank that has 10 grams of food added every day will get twice as contaminated as the same size tank that's only fed 5 grams. A tank with only a few fish that only gets an average of 1 gram a day can easily require one-tenth the water changes as the first tank. To complicate things even more, if you have an extremely efficient skimmer, large refugium, and actively clean your filter socks, it's very possible that a tank that's fed 10 grams a day has the same residual contaminants as the same size tank that has none of these things and only fed one gram. More or less, you're going to have to listen to some people you trust, factor these things in, and watch your tank. There are, however, some ways I've personally seen the most success with on my own tanks and the people I trust. This is going to be a balance of work versus tank stability. More frequent, smaller changes is best, but honestly, if you have a wife, three kids, a yard, and football to watch, you're going to have to be realistic. 15% once a week, I think, is close to ideal. 30 to 35% every other week is what I personally do, and 50 to 70% once a month might be acceptable if you're experienced at making sure the new seawater is the exact same salinity, alkalinity, and temperature as the tank water. Now, before everyone darts the comments area to tell everyone they do way more water changes or they've had success without ever doing a water change in their lives, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, if you've had multiple years of success with this method, you're doing it right and you found the right mix for your tank. I say multiple years because I think it's possible to be successful for a single year using basically any method. Real success really begins to show itself in year two or three. One of the biggest mistakes many reefers do is waiting to do a water change until you see issues with the tank such as corals look like crap or even dying and algae is blooming. 
Then doing a water change, everything looks better, and we wait to do the next one until the tank looks like crap again. Well, this cycle can be successful for a while. It always leads to the same place, an ugly tank where most of the corals have died, and you end up shutting the tank down. In this case, the best thing you can do is figure out how often you're doing the water changes and try to preempt the issues. If your issues show up at four to five weeks, start doing your water changes at three to four weeks. In fact, it'd be wise to string a few together and get the nutrients down before you start your new maintenance cycle. Keep in mind, if you do a single 20% water change, 80% of what you wanted to remove is still in the tank. So you'll have to do larger water changes or string a few together to significantly reduce the levels once you've let them get too high. Okay, time for the biggest question of the day. Who makes the best salt and which one should you use? Honestly, this is a loaded question because I've never seen anything based on any real science that I think is anywhere near convincing. No matter what option you pick, there'll be seemingly endless reefers who will tell you it's the best or worst salt ever. That said, I think there are three options that really stick out in the market for us and where everyone at BRS has seen the most success. First is Instant Ocean in reef crystals. It's amongst the most affordable options out there, most widely distributed, and seemingly countless reefers have had many years of success. I'm pretty sure it's the most popular option by many fold, and it's really hard to debate the success here. The most popular salt here at BRS is easily the Red Sea salt, both by our staff and customers. There are several things most people like about this salt. First, it's made by a privately held company whose sole focus is saltwater aquariums, and their success resides completely on the quality of the products they produce. They also do it well enough that other companies contract them to produce salt for their brand. There's a really big difference in priorities for a company like this versus large publicly traded conglomerates whose sole focus is shareholder value. After speaking with their scientists and other members of their staff, it's really clear to me that they're passionate about reefing and providing the highest quality product they can to their customers. The last one is the KZ Coral and Zook Reefer's Best Salt. Honestly, this is one of the more expensive salts out there, and like every other salt, there's limited supporting data. So I wouldn't blame anyone for being somewhat apprehensive. They do focus on trying to be as close to natural seawater as possible, which means slightly lower alkalinity than most. They were the first to really focus on the importance of potassium, and one of the few, if not only, who doesn't use caking agents in their salt. Beyond that, there are really two other elements. The more of their products I try, the more I like the brand in general. So far, every product I've tried of theirs has lived up to its claims, and I don't think there's a single other aquarium brand out there that has such an active global following as KZ. Certainly no other brand has an active forum based around their products like zeovit.com. Beyond that, my personal but completely anecdotal experiences with the salt have been really positive. The corals all look lush and really healthy. I certainly plan on using it for the foreseeable future. One thing that's a bit different about this salt is because they want to avoid using caking agents, you do have to shake the box and give it a quick mix by hand before use to make sure any particles that may have settled out during transport are reincorporated properly. Just a final couple quick tips. It's really important that you add any salt mix to water and not vice versa to prevent precipitation. And if you ever get a chance to try a digital refractometer, do it. Honestly, you'll never want to use anything else again. So tell us what your favorite salt is and what your water change schedule looks like down in the comments area below. If this is your first time with us, give us a quick thumbs up and subscribe. See you all next week with another episode of BRS TV.